Good morning. Good morning, everybody. I think we're just waiting for a few more people to arrive, but we'll, uh, we'll kick on anyway. Right, so um, I am once again honoured uh, to open CCN's annual conference here in Marlow. As always, I'd like to start with two important thank yous. First, to our strategic and conference partners who have most generously supported our annual gathering. Secondly, I would like to thank our CCN officer team, the magnificent seven and a half, who organise our conference so diligently and support us throughout the year. This is my fourth and final conference as chairman of this great network, and indeed the second longest serving chairman after Sir Paul Carter. While I'm sure you'll be pleased to see the back of me, I wanted to start, don't need to tell you there, I wanted to start by taking a, a moment to reflect on the journey of our network over the past few years. It has been a true privilege to lead this organization through what has undoubtedly been the toughest of times for local government. But at every step of the way, CCN has been with its members advocating for you and supporting you. Built on a unique understanding of our members and a robust evidence-based approach, CCN has led the national debate on local government in Westminster and the media. From reforming children's services to the future of adult social care, while also bringing previously niche subjects such as home to school transport to the forefront of the policy debate. We have taken the tough decisions by being the first to call for charging reforms in adult social care to be delayed. And we have not shied away from the difficult topics, not least on the desperate need to reform our broken SCND system. We have stood up for counties when it mattered the most, including on devolution, securing changes in policy direction, and of course the new combined county authority model. Morning, Barry. And most importantly, <laughs> <laughs> and most importantly, time and again, we have secured billions of additional funding for our councils. None of this could be achieved without your support and the commitment of our members to CCN. And I want to take this opportunity to thank you all. Whatever happens at the county elections next year, CCN will continue to punch well above its weight as a strong cross-party network. One that leads not only for county and unitary authorities, but for the entire sector. The ability of our network to lead from the front has been demonstrated most vividly in the lead up to and since the general election. Despite the surprise of an early election, CCN was prepared as ever, with our manifesto for counties providing a comprehensive and detailed policy platform to engage the new government. While the composition of MPs in the House of Commons may have changed dramatically, our approach to advocacy has not. Being a collaborative partner, putting forward constructive, practical and solution-based proposals. However, never being afraid to speak out on behalf of our member councils. Over the first 100 days of the new government, we have put this philosophy into action, not least on local government finance. Just 10 days ago, the Chancellor delivered her first budget. In the lead up to this, our research with PwC and Pixel laid bare the financial challenges facing councils this parliament. It was therefore welcome that the government recognised the financial pressures facing local government and provided an extra 1.3 billion in core funding, of which 600 million will be for adult social care. Moreover, the additional investment of 1 billion for special education needs is vital. <coughs> but as they always say, the devil is in the detail. And now the dust has settled, the headline increase in resources could do very little to bridge the funding gap facing our member councils next year. If councils are expected to pick up the bill for the higher than anticipated rise in the national living wage, this will add hundreds of millions more in unexpected costs to adults and children's social care next year. There remains real uncertainty over the impact of the, ri the rise in national insurance for councils and indeed care providers and whether, if at all, 
they will be fully compensated for additional commissioning costs. This will mean the 600 million new funding for social care is consumed by these additional costs alone, with little, if any, left to help meeting escalating demand for services. But for counties, it could potentially get worse, with the government prioritising a targeted deprivation approach for the remaining 700 million, rather than dedicating more funding directly through the social care grant. As a result, our analysis suggests that CCN member councils could potentially receive a third less in new grant funding compared to previous distributional approaches. This would equate to almost 190 million less for our member councils, spread right across our entire membership. We all recognise that deprivation, <coughs> excuse me, deprivation is an important indicator of need. Indeed, that's why counties already receive 46% less per head in social care grants compared to metropolitan boroughs. But deprivation is not the main driver of the unsustainable rise in council costs, nor the key measure of who is under the most financial distress. Whether it's the acute rise in children's placement fees, care for working, working age adults, <clears throat> or escalating spend on send home to school transport, it is demand and market failure that is pushing councils of all shapes, sizes, and political control to the brink. That's why the government should rethink its approach. As a minimum, the government must increase the proportion of the 1.3 billion dedicated to social care to ensure all council, all councils receive a fair share of resources. But with substantial new overheads created in social care delivery, the government should go further by diverting some of the 22.6 billion increase in NHS funding to social care. Crucially, the government must not seek to change or redistribute any existing resources within the local government settlement, because this would make a bad situation even worse. This doesn't mean that CCN is opposed to a full funding review this parliament, but this will be both complex and difficult to achieve. The government will need to balance the necessity of reform whilst ensuring it does not further undermine the financial stability of councils. Crucially, ministers <coughs> must, no, must also not succumb to pressure to cherry-pick certain changes that benefit parts of the sector, particularly on council tax. We recognise most county authorities can raise more in local taxation, and this needs to be appropriately incorporated into any funding review but a narrow focus on revenue-raising abilities and council tax equalisation in any future reforms would be financially devastating for most of the councils represented in this hall and have a significantly detrimental impact on our residents. So whilst we support reform, CCM will not stand idly by and see our councils unfairly lose hundreds of millions in funding. Over the coming months, the government must fully engage with the sector on any changes. In doing so, it must be a genuine, fair funding review that looks at both needs and resources. This will mean implementing the previous government's independently developed adult children's and public health formulas, and revisiting previous government plans for other formulae so they give equal weight to both urban and rural deprivation. Critically, any proposal to equalise council tax can only be a partial equalisation, alongside a commitment that no authority, no authority will lose an unsustainable level of resources with dedicated additional financing for all councils. Increasing and reforming local government funding alone, however, <laughs> will not put councils on a sustainable footing. As CCN has consistently argued, an agenda for reform is, driving, is key to driving down long-term costs and improving outcomes. Following concerted advocacy by CCN, the spending review commitments to fundamentally reform both children's services and the SCND system are to be strongly welcomed. 
In particular, we know our pivotal report with the LGA and ISOS partnership on transforming the SEND system has gained real traction with ministers. <clears throat> While tomorrow our new analysis with InPower will demonstrate how the dysfunctional children's placement market can be reformed to improve outcomes and reduce costs. And we look forward to working with ministers on both of these critical agendas. But while ministers have been more forthright in their commitments on reforming these services, much less has been said about adult social care. Early on, off the back of CCN advocacy, the government took the right and necessary decision not to proceed with charging reforms. However, this was only part of the necessary reforms we need to see across our health and care system. Our report with Newton, launched today, sets out how the needs of working age adults in social care must be at the centre of government plans for a national care service. But alongside bringing forward greater details on this proposed vision for adult social care, we must be actively involved in setting the NHS 10-year plan. Through the Council of Leaders and locally with integrated care systems, we must work together to address delayed discharge from hospital creating more step-down facilities, refocusing both systems on preventative activity and investing in early support and primary care. The future financial survival of both the NHS and local government is dependent upon managing demand. Only by local government working hand-in-hand -hand with the NHS can that and will that be achieved. And I look forward to hearing from the Social Care Minister later today on how we can work together to deliver this. Reform, nonetheless, may not be limited to the demand-led services we provide and the interface between health and social care. At the budget, the government has signalled their intention to explore local government reorganisation, creating simpler structures to support the devolution agenda. Over recent years, a number of county areas have successfully reformed to create unitary authorities. While I appreciate everyone's appetite for structural reform might not be the same, it is a debate CCN must actively engage in. However, many of us at this conference have been here before. In 2021, places like Surrey and many more were marched up the hill only for the previous government to get cold feet, of course, with the exception of Cumbria, North Yorkshire and Somerset. And with councils facing multiple competing challenges, we must avoid being led up the garden path once again. That is why it is critical the government provide absolute clarity on the scale of their ambitions while defining the rules of engagement in the forthcoming devolution white paper. First, to avoid conflicting bids by district and county authorities, government should not rely solely on bottom-up proposals with ministers providing a clear direction of travel. Second, structural reform should not be limited to two-tier areas, but also include small unitary authorities. Third, the government must use the white paper to set out a criteria for councils that ensures new unitary authorities are of the necessary scale. In our view, this should include confirmation of a minimum population limit of 500,000, with no upper population limit. Ensuring proposals span whole county geographies and support better public service delivery across the area. And minimizing the disruption to the delivery of care services. If these conditions are put in place, this network can have a sensible and grown up discussion with ministers on the future governance of non-metropolitan England including how directly elected mayors and combined authorities can work most effectively in county areas. Ensuring we enhance rather than diminish the role of local government. There is no doubt that the road ahead for counties will be rocky. Battles lie ahead and this network cannot and should not shy away from them. But equally, by working in partnership with government, there are great opportunities to deliver the service and structural reforms our sector so desperately needs. So I would like to finish where I started by thanking you all 
for your unwavering support for CCN. CCN is your organisation and this is your conference, so please do make the most of the next couple of days to network, to share ideas and of course to buy me a drink. Enjoy conference. <laughs>
It's very pragmatic. Of course, one could look at the budget and one could see perhaps an absolutely enormous tax rises and increasing spending on public sector pay. And one could conclude from that that this is a classic Labour government tax and spend. But actually, I don't think that is where lab this Labour government's thinking is. And I think the best way to understand the current strategy of number 10 is two axioms of Ronald Reagan politics. Uh, while they may not share Ronald Reagan's ideological perspective, they do recognise the capability of his politics. And those two axioms are, one, are you better off now than you were four years ago? And two, if you're explaining, you're losing. And that shapes in the sense that the first part is all about growth. Everything that this Labour government wants to do over five or ten years depends on getting growth. That's how they're going to restore public services. It's how they're going to improve living standards for everyone. So it's getting growth is all that Rachel Reeves is focused on, rather than classic Labour ideology of tax and spend. The second part, if you're explaining you're losing, is really that this Labour government doesn't want to uh, fail in the same way that Bidenomics has failed, in the sense that what President Biden achieved in the US was he raised, he did raise living standards. He did get a level of growth that we in this country would love to see. But as you can tell from last week, when it came to the ballot box, it didn't count. And the reason for that is ultimately, people will judge these things in their pockets. And if you're explaining to someone, no, no, the economy is really going well. It, actually, inflation is down from where it was. Rather than them feeling it, then they won't vote for you. So. After Sue Gray, there's been a, 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 a reshuffle in number 10 and a much more stricter focus on politics. So you have these two countervailing pressures that will really shape the next, uh, the next few years. One is absolute focus on growth. So wherever there is a decision that Rachel Reeves has to take between growth and an alternative, it will be for growth. And then secondly, this political need to make sure that that is actually felt in people's pockets. So I think within the budget, uh, uh, one of the key things was minimum wage rising. And that will be felt in people's pockets. But you can see that those are two countervailing pressures. And I think this will be the real interesting test over the next few years, as as we see that desire for growth coming up, that, uh, coming up against that political need for there to be real impact in people's pockets. In terms of the strategy for growth, it's really centred around attracting global investment into the UK. And Rachel Reeves probably overestimates the ability of stability to attract investment into the UK. We now have a government with a large majority that's here for five years. We're hopefully through the tailwind of the change uh, brought about by Brexit. So will stability and competence in itself attract investment? I think probably the Treasury have an over-rosy view of how much money will come in that way. So then there are the other ways that they're trying to do the supply side encouragement of investment, copying what the Americans have done. First part of it is attracting those investments. So we saw the investment summit a few weeks ago and central government boasting about how much investment was coming into the UK. Interestingly, the focus groups that number 10 has been running show that the impact of all of that talk about how much investment was coming in meant that voters, particularly the ones they care about, those that switched from Conservative to Labour at the last election, those voters, when they hear that talk about investment, all they hear is money going to the pockets of big business, not money into their own pockets. So they have to make this, uh, again, it's another example of that countervailing pressure one hand, they want growth. On the other hand, they need it to be felt in people's pockets. So growth will partly come through investment, but investment isn't going to come through just competence and stability. And what the government are trying to do, as you will know, is clear a path for investment by smoothing planning uh, reform and smoothing planning restrictions, by, if they can, tackling the challenge of higher energy bills, particular, particularly industrial energy bills, the cost of uh, energy in this country is higher than in any other 
developed nation. And so that's the idea of GB energy. Can that actually lower prices over time? The challenge there is those aren't going to lower prices for 10 years by the time that those things come on, on, on track. So through, and then, and then there's the industrial strategy where what Rachel Reeves is focused on so far, and we still don't really fully know, is tech, particularly AI, life sciences, and can those bring in funding? So let me put that together with an example of, of how this is supposed to work and where the challenges are. So one of the things we often hear talk about is uh, an AI nation, that Britain needs to be at the center and forefront of AI. Absolutely we do, we're a service economy, and if we're not at the forefront of AI, we'll be undercut by global competitors. Being an AI nation, what does that actually mean? Well, apart from having AI in a public sector and implementing that throughout the delivery of services, it also means we're gonna need more data centers in the UK. Uh, data centers require uh, massive construction, uh, which in itself could be a, a stimulus, but they're also uh, difficult to build, very difficult to get through planning. And the other thing is they consume an enormous amount of energy. So not only do you have to have data centers, you also have to have a strategy for how do you power those data centers. What we're seeing in the US at the moment, Google, Amazon, and Microsoft, all within the last couple of months, announced that those tech firms are, are funding the construction of nuclear power stations. Now, the idea that could we attract into the UK money from tech firms in order to build not only data centers, but the energy plants that would supply them. And that could be small modular reactors, but more likely it would be uh, wind farms and other forms of renewable energy. But how would we attract those to this country? So in a previous role, one of my jobs at a large tech company was to decide which global markets we should put uh, our data centers into. And what I found in Ireland, in Norway, in France, is I could talk to one person. I could go and there would be one person who said, we will sort everything out for you. If you want to build here, uh, if you want to build it, we want your AI, we want to be an AI nation. If you want to be here, we will put everything um, and, and tailor it around your needs. Um, whereas when you look at the UK and currently where we stand, the government is not intending to change that position. If you want to build in the UK, there is a long row of people that you need to talk to and not all of them talk to each other. And certainly they don't all have one unified view they have different views and different interests. So this is my example of, some, of one of the challenges that we've got with this approach. And my question to you would be, there are two questions. The first one is, so how do we make that work better? If we want global investment, and we also still believe in the importance of the local community having a say, rather than it all being done centrally, then how do we, how do we create a system where a global company could arrive in the UK and they could navigate that complex uh, ecosystem in a simple way. What's the best way to do that? A second question for you is, what's in it for you? What do you want? Why should a Microsoft or a Google or an Amazon come and build a data center in your backyard or build an energy plant and then, then suck up the profit from that? What's in it for you? What do you want to see from that? And I think there is a trade-off there, and I think there is an opportunity there, not just at the sort of macro level that Rachel Reeves can tick a box that our GDP and investment is increasing because we've got a new data center and in inward investment coming in. But what is it at the local level? What is it that you want to see? And I think that's the opportunity of being able to get the answer the first question right, is that you can also answer the second question right. But that needs more joined up thinking um, and that's my question to you, how do we do that? So I'll pause it there, and thanks very much. Thank, thank you so much, Theo. So there's your first two questions uh, that you might be thinking about. Um, I think it's remiss of me that I didn't mention uh, 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 Theo CV and, uh, and, in fact, Ian. So very, very quickly, um, Theo... Uh, 
cut his, uh, cut his teeth with, uh, uh, with the Labour Party and was uh, uh, Tony Blair's special advisor in Downing Street, Downing Street until 2006. Um, and after leaving Downing Street in 2010, uh, Theo worked as Head of Public Affairs at Telefonica uh, before June joining Google, uh, where he worked on a range of UK and European public policy issues for the next eight years. He joined TikTok, where he was Vice President for Public Policy and Government Relations, focused on European and global technology public policy issues, and engaging with global institutions on behalf of TikTok. So putting your thoughts and comments uh, in, in that perspective, thank you so much. Uh, and Ian O'Donnell, um, it is Deputy Chair of the UK Policy for the Federation of Small Businesses, uh, a business owner himself uh, from a very young age. Um, uh, he now serves as a non-exec for other SMEs as well as volunteering with the FSB where he leads on net zero, uh, working with uh, leading decision makers uh, to develop policy solutions for a better environment for SMEs. Um, Ian, the stage is yours for the next 10 minutes. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's really good to be here, and um, I'm just trying to. There we go. There's Appa. Um, so, first of all, for those of you that may know, not know the Federation of Small Businesses, we are the um, UK's largest business group. Uh, we're made up of individuals like myself, volunteers embedded in our own businesses, but keen to make sure that there's a great environment for all small businesses to thrive. And we are a not profit. So I'm going to talk about three areas this morning um, around potentially areas that you might be able to help and support the small business community, um, some that you have influence in. But just to set the scene, we've heard a lot there about macroeconomics. Small businesses are there at the heart of your individual communities. And why it's so important to ensure that they have a good environment for growth is often they're the ones employing those furthest from the labour market. The pounds spent in a small business tends to stay very much within the local economy. They are often the ones who run a small business because they've also got care responsibilities, feeding into, I know, the significant challenges you've got around that health and social care in your respective areas. So if we don't get the agenda and the environment right for small businesses, we will all suffer because they are the ones supporting our local communities. So first, the topic of business support. And you'll be aware of the major challenges around the transition from local enterprise partnerships, um, where do growth hubs sit, all of those sort of things. Inevitably, when there is change, there is also challenges but opportunity. Uh, and what we're seeing is there is a great opportunity to here to provide the relevant support for small business. However, there is a fragmentation problem right now. We're finding very much from our national view of this that very different levels and types of business support in different areas. There's a bit of a postcode lottery about the type of business support you've got. And one of the other things that happened is that increasingly the, where you go to find the right information as a micro or small business is uncertain. I've been around for long enough to remember the days of Business Link, and the, for all of Business Link's faults, it did have a national brand that most startups knew where to go to to get the information they needed when they set up. We lack that at the moment. And so one of the things I would encourage you to look at is, are you making sure there is a single point of contact? We've already heard that about for inward investment to the UK, we need it also for our grassroots small business community to have a point of contact when they have an issue for their business, who do they speak to, where do they go to, to find support, to find the right types of funding, to find the information they need in order to thrive. And engagement. There's some great exemplars of, since the transition to LEPS, of local authorities, councils that are engaging still with the business community, embedding business boards that have good small business as well as larger business representation. But that is certainly not the case across the board. And I would encourage you to make sure you have good, strong business engagement in your decision making, in their influence in the way you are moving things forward to ensure that their needs, their concerns are being considered. 
Just to give you a bit of an example of where um, small businesses, particularly high street small businesses, are really keen to see some support, um, in those top three there, you can see marketing and advertising support. High streets are feeling embattled. I'll come on to that a bit more in a moment. So they want to see support there. Technology generally lists social media training and support, but actually increasingly artificial intelligence. I'm on the government's digital adoption task force, and we're looking there. How do we encourage small businesses to use technology better? Um, and financial support for new investments, you know, matched grant funding, <coughs> things like that. So just a few things there. This is taken from our High Streets report. I'll cover that a bit more in a moment, but this is available to download free from the FSB website if you want to see this information in a bit more detail. A few recommendations for particular things that would be worth considering about small business support. Um, a women's enterprise support fund to support female-led startups. So there is still a, a barrier to entry, particularly around finance, for female-led and ethnic minority-led um, startups. So what can you do to make um, enable those parts of the community, often who also have care responsibilities and things like that. So th there is a, a real benefit in helping them create thriving business and increase the business support function for retail, leisure, hospitality, high street. Many of those have found themselves shut out of things like growth hubs and so on because they didn't fit the funding criteria and, and things like that. So often they've not had good business support. How can you perhaps fix that a bit? So I've mentioned um, uh, the sort of general picture of business support. A couple of other areas that you might want to think about um, that we have been particularly strong about speaking about for quite a long time in some areas. Um, procurement and payment. You all buy services as local authorities. Um, so are you inclusive of small businesses in your supply chains? I'm sure all of you in this room are, and I would love to hear those stories, but both directly and indirectly. So if you are choosing a big tier one supplier, how can you encourage them to use local small business? It allows you to unlock local economies of scale rather than pulling in um, business from outside, actually unlocking that local circular economy. And actually a small business can often be a best fit provider for a small issue. And of course, there's a significant social value to using your local small business supply chain for in your area. Payment. This is one of our big topics and has to be said, the Labour government has been very supportive of since they've come into power and in trying to improve the situation around late payment. It is a critical barrier of growth. So obvious thing, please pay quickly. Uh, and avoid, therefore, that domino effect of late payment down the supply chain. A and increasingly as well, you may be paying quickly, I know this is the case, to your tier one supplier, are you making sure that they are passing that rapid payment on down their supply chain and they're not holding on to that money for 45, 60 or even 90 days at times? So, high streets. We've just released our High Streets report looking at how do we create thriving, vibrant high street economies. Those market towns, those city centres, all of those are finding it challenging, shall we say, over recent years. And let's be honest, the small business community at the moment is feeling somewhat battered and bruised. It has not been an easy few years. It continues to not be an easy time. Costs seem are rising almost by month by month, and yet the support and the sort of encouragement for them seems to be sadly lacking. So, unsurprising stat perhaps, 69% of local business say there are vacant units on their local high street. And the challenge of that is around black spots, around um, the, if you've got a part of your high street that's got perhaps one or two vacant units, it sort of has that ripple effect. And, and many small businesses may start on a high street, go on to be internet success stars and things like that. So we need those thriving high streets to have that ripple effect in our overall local economy. 
So I'd encourage you, if you either have direct or indirect influence around some of what's happening on your local high streets, then what are you doing around meanwhile space? What are you doing around pop-up space? What are you doing about redesigning some of those big spaces, big holes left by large retailers who are never coming back to our high streets to create great opportunity space for start-up businesses? 57% of independent businesses say a diverse range of small business is vital for the future of the high street. So how can we foster that? If you look at this, it's just showing what's opening and closing. And overall, I would say the challenging theme there is you're seeing a lot more closing than you are seeing opening. Unsurprisingly, perhaps, straightforward retail, clothing, gift shops are seeing some of the highest close rates against opening rates. Hospitality, a mixed picture. Um, the one that's perhaps seen the, the, the closest match for opening and closing is the sort of personal care hairdresser space. And many of you have seen that shift on your local high streets. But we're seeing overall a challenge where more are closing than are opening. What does that mean? And particularly when it's a big store that closes, that leaves a big gap and that ripple effect thereafter. Parking. Sorry. 49% um, <laughs> of high street small businesses uh, say that parking facilities in their area are l poorly managed. I was speaking on BBC um, just last week about this particular topic. Key thing here is not about saying you cannot charge for parking, but it's the balance and fairness around the way that people can access retail. Too often still we find out of town retail parks, free parking, town centre, expensive parking, and often poorly managed in terms of safety, in terms of lighting, all of those things, which actually means people are prepared, might be prepared to pay but if they do, they want safe journeys from their car to where they're then going to go shopping. And crucially as well, I, I'm a big um, advocate of active travel uh, and alternatives to cars. We need to make sure there is accessible access to retail for all people, whatever their chosen form of transport. Uh, how do we create an integrated, safe approach for all of that? And I'm just being given the uh, reminder on timing. Um, so... Just there, we can see how are you going to have the conversations that you need with the small business community. One of the things you probably didn't want to see is the fact that actually the, it's harder the more you are a, a council, sort of district councils and so on, actually they don't engage with you. So if you want to get the messages out there, if you want to engage, you need to work through small business groups. What do small businesses want to see? We've mentioned marketing promotion. We've mentioned public transport infrastructure as well as car-focused design. Um, encouraging new local businesses and new local attractions into town centres. For that long-going sustainable view, diverse range of independent businesses, how do we make sure our town centres, our high streets have uniqueness, have a reason that sets them apart from other places? Affordable space, therefore. Still, many feel that places are overvalued in rates and rent. Good transport links. And crucially, a safe and a welcoming space. So just to finish, recommendations. How can we perhaps do things um, differently? High street manager, that single point of contact issue. Um, Long-term high street and town centre promotion plans. What's the agenda for the next year, two years, to make a difference? How can we promote our town centres and engage the small business community on that? Specialised funds to support some of those pop-ups and so on I mentioned. Um, regional or community-specific online marketplaces to, to help those start-ups with their online trading as well. Wi-Fi coverage, as we all know with Maslow's hierarchy of needs, that's now on there. Uh, disruption and mitigation action plans. So when you have some work going on, what's your plan to mitigate against the impact that that has? Big business might be able to last the one or two years of that going on. Small businesses go under during that time. And good traffic management design around low traffic neighbourhoods and issues like that to ensure that you've got good engagement 
with the business community on the impact that's going to have to make sure everybody gets a good outcome. If you want to know more about the High Street um, Plan and some of our other reports that will give you the information in more detail than I've been able to cover in that 10 minutes, do check out our website. But thank you very much and look forward to your questions. Thank you so much, Ian. That, that was, that was marvellous. Um, uh, and a common link there between the two presentations, which is who is the one person that you go to for your inward investment if you are coming from anywhere in the world? And then at the local level, who is it that's coordinating that local action, that local intervention to support you to make your business thrive or for a new business to land? Um, and thought-provoking thought, uh, comments there from both of our speakers, uh, colleagues, uh, who would like to uh, 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 kick us off? Uh, I can see that's Martin Tett straight away uh, 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 at the back. I wonder if a mic is coming to you, Martin. It probably is. Thank you. And for everybody, if you just uh, uh, introduce yourselves and where you're from, that'd be great. Thank you. Yeah, yeah thanks very much, Richard. Martin Tett, I'm the leader of Buckinghamshire Council. Uh, it's really, I think, more a question to Theo, because you said that the top priority for the new government is economic growth. And I chaired a session at the OJ conference where they said exactly the same thing. And yet we see a budget come out where we actually see both the minimum wage going up quite dramatically uh, and also the increase on employer national insurance. Um, and only on Friday, uh, the entertainer, which is the major chain, for example, of, uh, of toys in the UK based in Buckinghamshire, announced that all their expansion plans for new stores, new employment and so on have basically all been stopped now. Do you see a contradiction between the government's emphasis on growth and their emphasis on tax and spend, and in the budget, very firmly, a commitment to funding the public sector, which it feels like you're putting your foot on the accelerator on one stand, and you're put, putting your foot on the brake with the other foot? Uh, yes, I agree with you. I think um, that, uh, I, th I, think, I think the minimum wage won't be the break on growth. I think if it was just the minimum wage, I think there is an argument that's made in the US and that, uh, uh, that you could make in the UK that um, higher wage, higher quality jobs give people more confidence and that that in turn can lead to spending. There is a, a growth argument that you could make around minimum wage. National insurance contributions and, a, and the 25 billion t pound tax rise we saw there, I think it's very hard to make any growth case around that. And, but I think you know, the government's case is that that's necessary for the investment in public services. Uh, but uh, there's absolutely that, um, th those two countervailing pressures. Uh, one is uh, the need for growth and the second is um, the desire for you know if they're going to be re-elected in five years time they i think what they think is that ultimately over the last sort of five years or so people have got to the point where they can't see their gp in a in, in a short period of time they or someone they know are on a long waiting list uh, for uh, 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 in the nhs and there is an expectation among the public that those things need to be solved I think there's this, a broader question of can you do all of those things and get growth? I, and um, uh, I think the government are hoping that everything they're doing on the, to attract investment will, uh, will help on that. But if they can get growth above, uh, above forecast, then, um, uh, then the spending increases won't appear so, uh, so significant. And if they can't, then we're still stuck in the same rut that we've been in for the last five, ten years. But yeah, absolutely, it's 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 a conflict and it's two countervailing pressures. Thank you, uh, Ian. Yeah, I mean, my comment would be: a, there are five million small businesses in the UK, and if you're going to batter them, that doesn't seem to me to be a great agenda for growth. I think one of the challenges has been is the keenness to get all the pain points dealt with as quickly as possible as a new government. The problem is that that has hit small businesses, well, business in general, actually, with a load of things simultaneously. And often, as you say, each individual item may not be bad in and of itself, but that collective impact all at once has been the really painful thing for micro and small businesses. Okay. 
Okay, that uh, rather hit the nail on the head. Um, uh, lady, uh, four, four rows back at the front, please, uh, microphone. If you just raise your hand so they can, uh, there we are, that's great. Thank you. Um, Denise Turner-Stewart, Deputy Leader, Surrey County Council. Um, question for Theo, please. Thank you. So you were talking about um, attracting inward investment, data centres, um, and the importance of being a very receptive uh, country to, to an, an attractive um, for that proposition. Um, you were also talking about how, how our communities feel about um, bringing forward new um, installations, etc. So if we look at data centres and um, the congestion and the complexities we have in the southeast in terms of um, high population um, infrastructure plans that take sort of two or three years to install, the impacts on our road network um, in terms of our investing in our road network and that being disrupted and undermined and compromised by uh, the installations that come with these opportunities. How is that to be balanced? in an area where, as I say, it it's, it's really um, has great impact on our communities, okay. but then the Thank community you. has to appreciate that the investment is beneficial to the wider country, but actually because of the state of our national infrastructure, it's not able to, to, to receive that, um, that benefit because actually the, the impact on the communities is so detrimental in terms of mental health, people trying to access schools, etc. you know, just, just trying to go about their day-to-day -day business because of the impact of this infrastructure that that yeah, is, is a benefit great question that they Denise. may we'll not let, we'll, recognise. We'll let our panellists answer that. That's lovely. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, I, I mean, I think there are obviously uh, downsides to having a data centre constructed uh, locally, but there are also upsides. And I don't think the upsides are just national. Uh, you know, I'm, there is a, I remember we, we uh, my previous role, we built a data centre in Norway and there was a lot of hostility to the construction of the data center while it was being built. It was actually the largest data center in Northern Europe at that time. And, um, but the impact of the data center was that um, the mayor of the, of the town said that previously the experience had been that um, people grew up there and then they left to go and find work and that the experience of that community was a commuter community. And for the first time, people were coming to them, and that the people who were leaving college were finding jobs locally, and that that was a significant change to the community that was positive that they hadn't anticipated. It also helped that they got their energy uh, at extremely low cost as a part of the deal that they did around the data center. So I think you know, my question to you is, what is it that you want and need? What is it that you want in return for the hardship, definitely, that comes with having a large construction on your doorstep? But, what are, but there are opportunities there, and how do you make the most of those for your, for your local constituents? I think, I think that's absolutely right. We have a plethora of uh, solar farms, for example, and data centers arriving in the southeast for for all the reasons that you, you, you said here, we, we need those. Business will thrive because we have data centers. It, it is the way of the future, but what is that link? So uh, with all that energy being consumed, what is the benefit to the community? Will it heat the local swimming pool? If it's the solar farm, what's the link back into your voluntary, uh, volu volu voluntary structure? Where's, where's, where's the community support that, that comes from that? So I think that's, to be, uh, that's one of the things that we can, we can work on at a local, uh, local level. Uh, can I take any more questions? At, at the front here, Kevin, and then uh, in the middle, I think. Uh, thank you. Kevin Bentley, uh, leader of Essex County Council. In the conversation, which is excellent, you did talk about skills. Isn't skills the main driver of local growth? Because unless you've got people who are skilled, of all ages, not just young people, to do the work for the jobs coming in, you don't have growth. Should we be, and that's something we in County Councils are particularly responsible for, and we need freedom, devolution. Skills is controlled by the centre. We've talked about devolution. If nothing else happens, if you don't devolve skills, you won't get growth. Question. Yeah. Happy to pick that one up. Um, absolutely agree, <laughs> basically. Uh, um, but also, you know, the key part of that skills conversation as well is about that lifelong element of skills because we can get it right for young people. We can get them into the labour market, but they're probably going to have three or four different careers during their lifetimes. And the nature of the rapid 
changes brought by AI by other technology is not going to, in that pace of change, is not going to be stacking anytime soon. So how do we devolve and how do we, in our, then in our devolved plans, ensure a lifelong learning journey? And, and how do we, I, I also do some lecturing at Coventry University, so I have a sort of bit of an inside knowledge from the, that world as well. How do we create the, the right type of overall learning environment, blending all the different learning sort of providers out there so that people can go from basic skills all the way up to postgraduate learning within a career driven environment rather than a let's do a load of learning up until about 22 23 years old then it all stops and thereafter and oh if you need to retrain go and find out it out for yourself fundamentally which is a bit of our approach at the moment so absolutely it needs to be locally led it needs to be done with the a sort of lifelong learning plan at the heart of it. Thank you. Uh, further questions? I think there was somebody indicating... There's somebody there. Oh, over there. There we are. Thank you, Izzy. Thank you. Thanks very much. Izzy Second from Warwickshire. And Ian, as a Warwickshire person, you're very welcome here. And thank you very much for uh, contributing to this debate today. I want to build on Kevin's um, issue about skills uh, and, and how important the sort of um, the ecosystem of working with partners, both your organisation, the FSB, and bigger organisation as uh, councils. We don't have all the answers, and devolution potentially, um, you know, being one of the three councils with the Devo 2 and skills, will be coming to the council, um, but actually we don't have all the answers. And the important thing for me is understand the, the connection right at the beginning with our educationalists, but also the lifelong learning that you talk about. Um, I think there is a challenge for us in the FSB being cohesive themselves and trying to work out the needs of that particular community and, uh, and understand that it's a, a two-way system. It's not just about us supporting you, but it is about the FSB uh, supporting our partners, our educationists, and us in understanding yeah. what the needs are. So I wonder if you could talk a bit about that. Absolutely. <laughs> um, so one of the things that actually the sort of closing echo of the last government was the local sk skills improvement plans. I don't know if any of you have been aware of or involved in that process at all. Uh, I'm not, it's one of those things, I'm not quite sure what's happened to it now, but if you want data, if you want information, that part has been done. There's some great information in there. A lot of both qualitative and quantitative research done into what business needs from a skills perspective. So I would encourage you to um, have a look at that data, it's a basic thing. Absolutely endorse your point, this is a two-way thing. We need, small business needs to give you the information to say what they're looking for, uh, and you need to then provide that. And I would say, yeah, small business does need to sometimes hold its hand up and say, it's hard, but then also small business has very limited resources, just as you yourselves do, and sometimes finding the time. And that's why when you do have those opportunities to get that data on a sort of that level, worth looking into. So if you haven't looked at that, would encourage you to do so. Um, but as you know, more than happy to have that conversation in more detail, should you want to. Okay, sounds like a Warwickshire conversation. Um, <laughs> uh, we've got time for one more question. Oh, you will keep hiding behind the lectern. There we are, thank you. <laughs> Hi, thank you. Um, Councillor Camcor from Warwickshire. Sorry, you're getting bombarded from Warwickshire. Um, this is a, a, a reality question, really. And so um, before I even brush my teeth, I don't know how many people in this room are actually business-minded or have businesses. Be as a result of the budget last week, I need to find £200,000 just to cover insurance and minimum wage. And I just want to just push on the question around growth, because actually... You know, if, I, if I'm going to struggle and I, I, you know, I'm reasonably okay and, I, and I've got ways and means of trying to do that, but those micro businesses that you've talked about this morning are really going to struggle and actually that is going to have an impact on our communities and that's what's concerning me. So if we can just broaden, you know, around growth, that would be great. Thank you. 
There we are. Thank you. That's the, uh, uh, the, the, the dichotomy that we have at the moment, which was Theo set out. I don't know if you comment on that. I think uh, national insurance contributions for Tesco was going to cost them a billion pounds, I think, was uh, in the press only a few days ago. So um, uh, a comment on, on that? Yeah, I think... I th and, and, and positives as well as impact. Right? Well, I think it is a challenge. Um, and and I, I think nobody knows what's going to happen next. And uh, I don't want to add doom to your uh, morning toothbrushing uh, exercise. But, you know, with, with Trump and trade tariffs, uh, there's lots of reasons why uh, we could be uh, doomsterish about the, the future. But I do think there are uh, causes for optimism. The UK economy is picking up relative to the rest of Europe. We not only look uh, increasingly like that growth will be here, but also political stability in the UK versus France or Germany. And for those global businesses that are looking to invest in the UK, I think the UK looks relatively undervalued at the moment. And while that uh, global investment doesn't make a direct difference to the, the local shopkeeper or the, uh, the local uh, storeholder, the more confidence and money there is in the pocket of people, uh, the more confidence there is in their jobs. And you know, one of the big drags on consumer confidence at the moment is a sort of anxiety that goes all the way up the middle income sta scale, uh, that they are worried about the future of their jobs, they're worried about the, ro the, the, the world. I think if we can see more stability and a bit more confidence coming back in, in, in their ability to f afford things, I think that will make a difference to the high street. But we won't know that for uh, some time to come. I'm, re I'm, re I'm really sorry. Um, we, we are just about out of time. Um, uh, I, I, I would like to thank uh, both Theo and Ian so much for their contributions. And also just reflect on the paradox that if you're explaining, you're losing at a conference. So thank you. <laughs>
If I introduce them, and I'm not going to read out their bios, they're on the app if you want to, to get to the bios. Um, we have, um, speaking first, um, Steve Quartermain, who used to be the uh, chief planner uh, and is, is very good at diplomatically pointing out to politicians when we're talking nonsense about planning, something I've got personal experience of. He's very good at that gentle explanation. Um, so, and then after, after Steve, um, we will have uh, Dr. Victoria Hills, who is the chief executive of the Royal Town and Planning mm -hmm. Institute and now gets some revenge. I think it was, it's at least one panel, two panels you chaired where I was talking on and on about planning in the course of this year. So it's your turn for a bit of revenge <laughs> um, there as we, we, we get to that process. So uh, without any, any further ado, um, uh, Steve, I believe you're up first on our running order. So you have 10 minutes to explain to us how to make the planning system work. Small challenge. Uh, in, in, indeed. Thank you very much, <coughs> Richard. And, uh, uh, um, as ever, <coughs> being flexible, I thought I was speaking second. Um, the planning slot. Um, now, uh, in about 1994, uh, there was an audit commission report that said something like planning. Um, popularity for a planner is an unachievable objective. Because you're either saying no to something that people want to uh, have, or you're saying yes to something that people want to object. But planning is important, and I'm going to talk uh, in my 10 minutes a bit about where I think we are, and, but also try and set a bit of a challenge for you. It, it, it's a bit of analysis, a bit of a challenge. So <coughs> but over the years that I was chief planner, I think that uh, I witnessed what I saw was a sort of political obsession with fixing the system. <coughs> um, uh, there were a number of reviews. That you, you'll probably recall uh, quite a few of these yourself. Uh, there was, uh, from the Red Tape Challenge, uh, Killian Pretty's review. There was a Penfold review, looking at sort of development management, development control, as it was in my day. The Letwin review. There have been a number of think tank papers that say, you know, this is the way the planning system should operate, and don't do that, do this instead. And that led to a number of white papers that have said, no, we're going to fix the housing system, we're going to fix the planning system. The common thought to all of this was the fact that the planning system was uh, too slow, it was too expensive, and it didn't deliver. Now, the, I always thought that was the, the irony. There was the, uh, the fact that actually the government implemented most of the recommendations from things like the Killian Pretty Review and the Penfold Review. So despite implementing all those uh, uh, recommendations, it still didn't deliver. So you said, well, OK, uh, <coughs> what, what, what is the, uh, the, the problem? That view about it not delivering still prevalent today. Lack of delivery was the driving force behind the political decision to do away with regional planning. Uh, the Secretary of State at the time said, you can't tell me that the figures in these plans are delivered. And I wish I could have done, <coughs> because uh, it was a view that the a better approach was to devolve this decision-making process more locally. And when that Secretary State came into the building, we all had to chant localism, localism, localism. It was interesting that, that at the time, <laughs> um, um, uh, the uh, planner by, by profession, I, I, I do look at what's happened in the past, and, and actually in 1943, uh, <coughs> in the post-war period, there was a, a view that um, <coughs> there needed to be built 450,000 houses a year over the next 10 years post-war, and that the only way that would be delivered would be for there to be a ministry for housing and a national housing strategy. And it's uh, um, uh, interesting that we now face a government which has some of those things back on its agenda today. So a high number of houses needed, talk about a national housing strategy, and also talk about, which I'll come to in a minute, about where that uh, process is best delivered. And I think the, you'll find that the CCN has a key role to play in that. Now, <clears throat> I think we can discuss perhaps in Q&A or over coffee about whether or not regional planning was given enough time to work. Uh, but it does need to be remembered that planning is a slow burn. We're talking about trying to predict things that are going to take place over the next 10 or 20 years. It's, uh, in my view, uh, a, a case that short-term fixes are not necessarily the answer. Planning is complex. Uh, planning is, at times, difficult. Um, <coughs> and that lack of immediacy about the, when things happen sometimes makes it hard for communities to buy into that long-term vision. But 
That's not a reason not to do it. <coughs> and I say this because the government, current government, whilst looking at planning reforms, has put planning at the centre of its growth agenda. It's <coughs> determined to see more um, uh, growth and it's determined to see more houses delivered. Um, it's determined to have a more interventionist approach too. The decision last week, uh, I was on holiday, you can tell kind of, I've got the suntan. I was on holiday last week, but even I picked up from, from where I was <coughs> that um, the decision to call in the application in Swale has sent ripples through the system. Because here we have a decision which was uh, going to committee, uh, I understand, to be refused, but the government called it in. Now, when I was chief planner, the call-in was something you did for applications that were about to be approved. You were looking to see whether that was the right decision to make. Was it right to approve it? You knew that if there was a recourse through an appeal process, you'd let that appeal process run. You might recover the appeal and say, well, we're going to have a look at that appeal decision itself. But here we've had a government that's called in an application that was going to be refused. And I think that's uh, an understandably has sent some uh, ripples through, through the system. Now, the government has consulted on a new MPPF, <coughs> and it's also consulted on a whole range of stuff, such as you know, how planning committees might work, uh, how funds might unblock um, stored sites. It's promoted a digital approach to planning. It's taught to uh, providing more resources for the delivery of the planning service. And obviously, the key objective, 1.5 million houses to be built in this parliamentary term, and including a significant amount of social rent. Now, uh, in my 10 minutes, Richard, I, I don't think I can speak to all of that agenda, but I am going to talk about a couple of, uh, I think, key issues which, which I think you, you may want to uh, talk about in Q&A. The first is about the standard methodology uh, based upon stock, and the second is this issue about reviewing green belts and grey belts, and, and, and in fact, the way that uh, if it's not done through a plan-led system, that the MPPF currently sets out an agenda and explains to developers how they should go about <coughs> bringing forward grey belt sites too. Now these particular issues have <coughs> brought a lot of comment and, and uh, <coughs> but, but before I do talk about them, the MPPF has a lot of other stuff in it too, which uh, you, you, if you don't just focus on this, uh, and I'll give you an example of that, the, the MPPF talks about having a vision-led approach to transport strategy. Now, the last week, I, I, I heard him talk about active travel plans. A vision-led approach to transport in planning it means that you don't necessarily have to assume that every house is going to have two cars. A vision-led approach says, well, let, we have a development that may have no cars in it. <coughs> and so that there, is an, uh, there are things in the MPPF that are big hooks to big change. And it isn't just the, 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 uh, the standard methods or as your grave but, but I will talk a bit, a bit more about them. Um, <coughs> The, the, the standard methodology, uh, I can remember it, it, when, when it first came about. The, the problem we had was that a load of people were debating about <coughs> whether their methodology was better than, than somebody else's. So you go into examination and you spend a lot of time talking about the method rather than the, the wares. And the, the idea of the government in introducing a standard methodology was to cut all that out and say, look, let's just have a standard approach. We know what the figure is. And then let's just talk about how much of that figure you can deliver or where it's going to be. So in principle, the standard methodology was supposed to be a helpful thing. Um, <coughs> it's aimed to sort of help progress the plan. You could argue it's better than not having one. You could argue that no standard methodology is going to be perfect, uh, and this is a, a different version to the one you had before. But it is, this particular version is meant to drive higher figures. So if you say, well, it's led to higher figures, well, that's what the government's saying it wants. It wants higher figures, so it's come up with a standard methodology which produces higher figures. Now, <coughs> um, I will return in, in a little bit about some of the issues that it also needs to address. Don't forget that the standard methodology, it's mandated, or it's proposed to be mandated, that you use it, that it is used. That's different from saying that it's going to be mandated that those figures will end up in your plan. The mandating is you must have the standard methodology. LPAs will still be looking at the constraints. Constraints are still constraints. And so the LPA will, will be looking at how much of that figure they can deliver. The key difference, in my view, is the government is looking for a much more robust approach from local authorities to demonstrate how they have tried to get as close to that figure as they could. And I think I saw so many plans in, in my days in, in central government 
where members had taken the view that they knew how much they could uh, plan for, what the figure was, and planned to that figure. And I think that the approach is, no, no, you must try and reach and get as close to the standard methodology as you can. And that does then bring in the, the Greenbelt issue. And looking at Greenbelt, Greenbelt still is about 12.5% of, uh, of the country. Uh, the actual country as a whole has about 55% of constraints across it when you take national parks, ALBs and SSSIs. And so so we, we, it is a, a, a constraint. But the, um, the approach to, to um, uh, looking at the Greenbelt, which we all know is not an environmental policy. I don't need to tell you it's not an environmental policy. People talk about it being an environmental policy. It's not. It's a spatial policy. It's just to keep things apart. But if you're looking at how you should review it, the government's setting it out. It's a sequential test, looking at brownfields first. And, and, uh, and if you were to do a, a, a Greenbelt review, the sites that would come forward that you might think, well, is that still functioning as part of the green belt in the way that I, th I think meets the five objectives? The grey belt are those sites. Th those are the sites that you would have on your list for can we release this? And of course, the developers have the exactly the same approach. And if you haven't got a plan in place, well, that's what they're going to be using when they're uh, coming forward with their planning applications. Obviously, if you want to determine, and <coughs> I say, uh, for the county network, because I think this is coming onto your agenda soon, because uh, I think this, this is going to be lifted to, to a level where you're going to be playing a bigger part in this. If you want to determine where <coughs> development takes place, you need to have a plan. And, and that's really the, the, the mantra that the government has been saying for, for a long time, of, of, of whatever colour. It's a challenge why local planning authorities don't have uptake plans. Only 25% of the parties who believe figures at the moment, have what they would say is an up-to-date plan. Um, <coughs> we don't really have a plan led system, do we, if only 25% of local authorities have, have an up-to-date plan. And if you don't have an up-to-date plan, it can't be an, a totally unexpected outcome if you lose appeals, because the system's set up for, for that to be the case. So it's sort of working. If you're losing appeals and you don't have an up-to-date plan, that's how the system's supposed to work. So having a plan is really important. The five-year land supply would be less of an issue if people were actively trying to deliver their plans. The housing delivery test originally thought, well, we won't need a five-year land supply. Because if you're delivering the, the housing numbers that are in your plan, then you don't need to have a five-year land supply. Well, of course, that hasn't actually uh, landed, and we do still need to have a, a, a five-year land supply. And it's a question about how proactively that's going to be used to actually deliver. Some councils seem to be content not to have a plan, and we've seen it. Uh, whether that's politically driven or whether it's political expediency, waiting for political change or, or experiencing political change, or not having the corporate commitment or resources to do it. But this is an, an, an outcome that can't be blamed on the system itself. And I come back to why people keep trying to fix the system. Well, actually, it's delivery. It's, a, it's, it's actually how the system is implemented. And I don't want to be too controversial in setting up the uh, discussion, but you know, th there's an argument that it's an abdication of responsibility. If you don't have a plan that plans for the, your community's future needs, there are over 300,000 people on the waiting list in London. There's a record 145,000 children in temporary accommodation. A one in every 20 child in the school is from a temporary accommodation. There's a record 112,000, over 112,000 households in TA. 1.74 billion pounds was spent on TA. Well, you're thinking, well, the answer to, to um, creating uh, more houses isn't just about filling the empty houses. People talk to, have said to me, oh, there's a million houses that are empty. Well, only 266,000 of those are long-term empty. And, and it isn't just about stopping the immigration. Ask yourself why it is your children are still living with you or have moved back in with you. Ask yourself why it is house prices are so high. Why is overcrowding so, so prevalent? Bear in mind that house building, and listen to the earlier discussion, house building is a significant contributor to the UK economy. It's a significant part of the, of the, of the, of the um, equation. Now, there are other things to issue, and I said that. It's not just about planning. We do know that we need to make sure that developers build out quicker. We need to know that uh, the, the viability arguments are, are tested. We need to talk to them about profit margins, returns to investments, access to mortgages. 
The falling contribution of small and medium en uh, enterprises, the SME builders, uh, they've fallen from about 12,000 to less than 2,000. And, and uh, the, these small sites are an important part of the equation. The importance of good design placemaking, the importance of infrastructure delivery, the importance of environmental protection, and the challenges of climate change. It is difficult. And it, I said at the very beginning, planning is difficult and it is complex. But I would say that um, it's not easy. And I would also say that no is sometimes the right answer. It's not a question that everything, it's a, a free for all, build where you like. No is sometimes the right answer. But in conclusion, you got it, so Richard, uh, just bear in mind. Uh, <coughs> the willingness to find a way to say yes needs to be nurtured. And as I said, I think this is going to come onto your agenda very soon. Uh, the devolution bill might well change the way in which planning is actually delivered. You don't necessarily need to reform the planning system to do it, but you do need to have that corporate ambition. You do need the resources. You do need to have a plan. A good planning outcome does make lives better for the people who live in your patch, and managing change is part of that planning agenda. And we might want to reflect in the Q&A, perhaps, about quite how much weight we place on protecting the status quo when we're supposed to be bringing about change. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. So fail to, um, fail to do your planning and plan for chaos. Um, Victoria, over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Councillor, and thank you, Steve, for teeing that up nicely. And it really is great to have an opportunity to come and speak with so many leaders of councils, councillors here today. Um, I won't introduce myself further, you've got that, but I will just remind you, for those of you not familiar with the Royal Town Planning Institute, that we are the professional institute for chartered town planners. We have 75% of the market in the UK, uh, and what that means is half of our members are public sector, half are private sector, and we've got 27,000 members now globally across 80 countries, although our largest uh, cohort are here in the UK and Ireland. Uh, we are an unregulated profession, but it's unheard of to get anywhere near 75%. We suspect most of the planners who are working who aren't chartered are in local government, so I'll just leave that with you um, to have a think about. Um, but here we are talking about planning reform. Um, we've got the, the question set, locally led, um, or planning by appeal. And I hope to share with you a few thoughts to get the conversation going in our Q&A on this. And it very much is the hot topic, if you uh, like. Now, just a, a bit of the backdrop. We know that, um, as we've heard from the uh, past chief planner, it's been, planning has been sort of used as something that's need to be fixed, something to be sorted, something to be, you know, these are not my words, an axe to it or bulldozed. Um, and actually, what we need to do now is to move the conversation forward to think about how we can utilise it. And that would be my call to arms to you all in the county councils and unitaries as you find yourself in perhaps a slightly unexpected position, uh, but a very important one when it comes to the devolution and future arrangements for planning. This is against a backdrop of um, a lot of uh, under-investment in planning. We know that uh, through our own research at the Royal Town Planning Institute, a quarter of planners have left the public sector between 2013 and 2022. So it's hardly a surprise when people talk about planning delays, not being able to get answers back. Well, 25% of the staff who used to be there pre-2013 just aren't there now at a time where we have growing population, growing pressures for housing, for infrastructure. Um, so it's hardly a surprise that things have perhaps been um, a, a bit tough going. However, on a positive note, we've never had so much talk of planning and lots of changes through the national policy planning framework. We've been responding to that. The latest changes, we'll see some rolling back of the previous changes. A um, bit of a theme here, lots of changes. And I think what we're asking for now, and I think we'd all agree, is just a period of stability so that we could all just get on with what it is we're trying to do. Um, 
And with that stability, we would hope that that certainty and clarity comes sooner rather than later, because the last thing anybody needs is a five, another five years of sort of not knowing what, what we're doing um, and what's happening in the interim. And that leads me on to my second point. This interim period, as alluded to by the uh, title of this session, is really going to be quite critical. Uh, what we've been advocating for at the RTPI is a, is a bridge, if you like, um, during this interim period, some very clear clarity and guidance from the department as to what they would like to happen in advance of the MPPF changes getting adopted, in advance of there being a devolution bill, planning and infrastructure bill, um, in, and in advance of strategic planning becoming a thing. Because at the moment, what we've heard is um, we would like a functional economic areas for strategic planning in the next five years. Uh, but you'll all know a lot can happen in five years. So we do need to be crystal clear as to what happens with the running the business of this important planning system during that interim period. And very recently, we published a detailed uh, report for the minister that's out in the public domain, being very clear as to what is needed. Um, far too much detail for this session now, but suffice to say, you won't be surprised to hear we're asking for a very clear timeline and, and also what is expected um, of authorities like your own to be producing now um, to get ready for that interim period so that you can be on the front foot rather than on the back foot. Um, we've heard already sort of challenging housing targets. You know them because you've already got them in your areas. And now you're thinking, what do we do with these? For many of you in the room, I suspect you have seen an uplift in those uh, figures. Um, and for some of your chief planners who I speak to regularly um, have told me that it's not just a little uplift, um, it's quite a big uplift. And with that brings um, challenges, as alluded to by the title, planning by appeal. Because if you don't have sites allocated and you have a government target, um, that does provide a vulnerability that, that um, actors in uh, the arena, particularly those bringing forward sites, could make a credible case to a planning inspectorate that they may know better than you do in terms of where the sites need to go. So I couldn't support the comments more than we've just heard from Steve. It's really important now, like never before, that you get your plans adopted so that you can be in control of your destiny rather than having planning done to you and done to your communities. Because we all know not only do the community deserve more, the community want more. They're a lot closer to their communities than they would have been pre-pandemic. Um, because planning is rarely out of the news and the housing crisis is rarely out of the news and all of the other associated issues on infrastructure, on migration, on uh, uh, temporary accommodation, I can go on. The public are far more informed about these things now and they want to be part of the conversation and there's a real opportunity for you to be leading that conversation with them but there is also a sense of urgency until we see some of that guidance uh, coming out from government as I've alluded to. Um, so it is a challenging time but it's also a very exciting time if I may, um, for the uh, organisations in the room, the county councils and the unitaries, there appears to be a very significant role coming down the line for you to be um, involved in this new rebirth, if you like, renaissance of strategic planning. Now, we are yet to see some detail, uh, but nevertheless, in areas, for example, that don't have a devolved mayor and there'll be some more... Um, detail no doubt coming out in the devolution bill what that means for planning um, the next big sort of thing in town are the county councils and unitaries um, and you know that they there provides a real opportunity for you to get to grips with some of those strategic uh, issues none of which i suspect are new ones um, just coming up here today i was reminded as i got out at high wickham station i started my first job out of newcastle university as a transport project officer at uh, Wickham District Council. And it would appear the strategic issues we were grappling with then, nearly 30 years ago at Handy Cross, are still very much alive this morning <laughs> as we were struggling to get through the traffic. Um, so none of these, are, a lot of the time, these are not new issues. You know, there's no sort of, wow, we didn't know that. You know what the issues are already. 
It's about how you can pull it together, how you can concertina it across, yes, it's housing, but it's infrastructure, it's environment, it's growth, it's skills, and bringing it all together um, as a plan that you're going to deliver for local communities. So if I was working um, in a, a unitary or county council, I would think, wow, this is actually quite an exciting time if you can play your cards right. Of course, there's always an if, um, and I think that's why this conversation this morning is really important, because it's about getting your ducks in a row with a very clear proposition to government about how you're going to deliver um, rather than have things done to you. Because I think all too often we're seeing this nimby-yimby um, play out, uh, which is deeply unhelpful, actually, um, because I think it really dumbs down the fact that most communities are aware that there, there is a need for more housing, there is a need for more infrastructure. They would like to be part of the conversation, um, but they would also like to see um, you know, things set out clearly in a plan that everybody can buy into and move forward um, together. So um, I guess in summary, because I know we're a bit short on, on, on time here, um, I would urge you to do everything you can to set your stall out in a statutory sense as soon as possible via your local plan. Um, I would urge you to be uh, robust uh, in, uh, and ambitious. Uh, I would urge you to invest in your planning service. Now is not the time to make budget serving savings in an area that can help you grow your economy. Uh, with, the, with the exception of fiscal powers that you have, um, planning powers that you have already, but those that are coming soon, are really the most, you know, they're the most powerful tools in your, in your toolkit for delivering those growth plans. And you're going to need um, some really excellent staff with you. I'm sure many of you already have that, Bear in mind the 25% I've said that aren't around anymore. One of the things we're advocating for is a chief planning officer back at the top table of local government. And you will say, well, you would say this, wouldn't you? However, you're going to need those statutory chief planners now like you never needed before, because this interim period, which is you know, uh, potentially precarious, well, let's wait and see the um, the, the detail that comes out from government that we've been urging them to issue, um, you're going to need to get very organised and you're going to need to be able to articulate your arguments in a waterproof way about what your economy needs, your population needs, what infrastructure is needed to ensure you're putting the right jobs, the right homes in the right places. So I'm also been, been a little bit provocative with you uh, now. I will pause um, but I do want to finish on, on the positive note by saying this is a, a golden opportunity for county councils and unitaries. Um, use it. Thank you. Thank you, um, uh, Victoria. So just to reiterate, I'll see some hands coming up, which is great. I, I think your point, housing targets, we may not like them, but they're legal housing targets. We've got to build them. So if we don't have plans, we're in deep trouble. Um, if we then come to, to, to questions. Yeah, Julian. I think so, yeah. Um, Julian German, Cornwall Council. Uh, good plans in place. We all agree. Uh, local planning, led planning system. Great. We've got all of that. So what, how important then is land banking in thwarting housing delivery? And if it is important, what should government be doing to stop land banking? Thank you. Who wants to have a bash at that first? Do one at a time. Yeah, go on. That's a big one. Well, I mean, I believe that um, part of these planning reforms include provisions to strengthen your CPO powers, putting it frankly. So um, I think in my assertion that we would like to see councils being bold and going for it, um, that that's exactly the sort of thing I'm talking about. You know, if, if, if sites are sitting there and nothing's happening with them and hasn't happened for, with them for some time, then you have to ask yourself, you know, the, what do, the community deserves better. We've got an urgent crisis um, to get our sort of uh, waiting list down. We're just going to need to move forward. So I think that's an area where there is an opportunity for councils to be bolder on um, CPO. Obviously, we've, we've only seen primary references. We've got the secondary legislation to come. Um, but I would urge uh, councils to get more proactive in, on, 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 on those sorts of instances. 
but nothing's ever straightforward and being able to get the choreography right in the right way to ensure that you're actually able to move forward with it is really important that's why i come back to investing in the team because all too often and i'll say this i've got half my members in the private sector all too often they're very well organized in the private sector and it's about getting um, a, ba a level playing field with the public sector to ensure that you can be um, calling the shots uh, rather than them. Very, very briefly, uh, um, the, uh, the NAO did a report, uh, and in fact there's been several reports on whether or not land banking exists. Uh, and, and the conclusion has been that it doesn't, now bear with me, <coughs> that, that land banking itself doesn't exist, that developers will want to build out as quickly as they can. And that's what the real issue is. It's the build-out rate. And when the Letwin Review looked at this, they said, well, there's an absorption rate. Builders only build out as fast as people will buy. And that then means that there's a market break sometimes on sites coming forward, which gives you problems for the planning authority when you're trying to say, well, I've approved this, but they're not building it. And that's what I was alluding to when I was saying that there are other things that need to be fixed outside the planning system about how developers deliver. Um, there's been a lot of talk about use it or lose it uh, and th that sort of approach to try and get developers to build out more quickly. And that's really where I think quite often people talk about land banking. But uh, um, although um, there's always a need for a pipeline, any business needs a pipeline of sites that are coming forward and the like, um, and that may or may not include land they have options on as opposed to they've actually got planning permission on but the actual uh, the way in which the market operates and the speed of build out is i think at the heart of the issue for you thank you we had some more questions i've got um uh, lady at the back sorry i'm struggling to see uh, oh sorry how could i not have noticed you Amanda? apologies uh, um i've got a list so <laughs> apologies in advance but you've taken one of them which is which I was going to point out. We've had our targets doubled in County Durham. They wouldn't need to be doubled if the builders developed what's already got permission, not what's being banked, but what actually has physical permission for. This to me seems very much like local government is being made a scapegoat yet again around planning. Um, we can be as proactive as we want, but at the end of the day, government has a top trump card of overriding everything at appeal. And within a few weeks of government coming into place, they've already overridden a decision in our county that's going to cost us the best part of £30 million because they've backed the developer to not put enough money in for the infrastructure and the schools and have just gone ahead and said, you can do what you want, basically. So who's going to reimburse local authorities for that money when it is just what appears to be a developer's charter? And it's not and I'm absolutely not anti-development. I am pro this, we need this, but it needs to be done correctly. And we are banking up for people in our position of the future, an absolute nightmare scenario in what they're gonna to have to deal with. And I'm thankful I won't be a councillor in about 30 years when these estates are up and running and all the issues there'll be with them. And not least, there needs to be a change right now in the development on land management at the end of developments and on commuted sums because that is a cash cow for developers. And I'm sure I'm not the only one who's got new estates within their wards and within their constituents where developers are allowed to charge a maintenance fee to look after the land. The latest one in my ward started at £60. It's gone up to £300 within three years, and there is nothing that the residents can do to stop that, and that's on freehold properties. And we've got to get a grip of that, because we are just, we just opened the door for landowners and for developers to do exactly what they want at any cost. Thank you, Amanda. I think we may need a self-help group to convene at the bar later to, to, to work through some of these issues, because, my goodness, they're, they're painful, aren't they? Is there anything there you can comment uh, on? A couple of things. The, the, the government's on with the issue about maintenance and maintenance fees. It's, it's already made it clear that it's going to try and tackle that. Uh, the appeal decisions are independent of government, uh, unless they've been called in or covered by the government. The, the planning inspector operate independently of, of any government uh, issue. 
Uh, there needs to be between 20 to 40 percent more planned permissions than actual houses built because of the fallout rate and not, not all permissions do, do get built and so there is a fallout rate of, of, of permissions. Um, but, but you're right in some, in some respects and, and, and that's why I did allude to it. The, the, uh, the, uh, this isn't a one-sided debate. This isn't just about local planning authorities, and county councils and district councils just saying, here's more land, here's more land. Developers have got to step up to the plate too and not only deliver the permissions that they've been granted, but deliver the places and the uh, quality of designer places with the infrastructure, both physical and social infrastructure, that is being demanded in local plans. And it is in local plans that you can demand this. And every local plan should have a design code which says, if you're going to develop, this is what we expect you to be delivering as part of that development. And what the government has said is, the previous government and this current government has, has, has carried on with it, is that design codes and setting the standards are crucial for local plans to set the agenda for, for developers to follow. And, and I would just add to that, um, and I don't disagree with any of it, it it's, it's all perfectly um, correct. Uh, we published uh, research last week. Uh, it's our location of development research. We've been it, number four. We've been running this research now for the last decade uh, because nobody else was doing it. Actually, just looking at uh, how sustainably located are, are these new homes, and unfortunately, what it's what it's showing is that um, things are not improving, and we're still seeing far too many homes going in places that are not accessible by public transport, walking or cycling, um, to highlight the point on infrastructure you make. Um, why is that important or why is it relevant for this conversation? Because I suspect a lot of those sites that aren't perhaps in, in the right places are ones that have been won by appeal. Um, and so it, it may sound uh, a bit like a broken record, but it does come back to the point of being very clear about where you want those homes. And if you haven't, you know, what I would do is, and it's a trick that we, we, we used in um, uh, the, uh, when I worked for the mayor's office before, is it takes a long time to get something adopted, but you can certainly have several spatial visions, uh, frameworks on the route, you know, so you can be very clear so that when said house builder comes and, and knocks, um, you make it very clear to them. Gosh, I'm, I'm very conscious here, there's press in the room, but you can make it clear to them um, that this is where you would like the homes, um, and if they don't play nicely with you, when, when you do have that adopted plan, uh, they will never build another home again <laughs> in your area, for example. You know, it's just asking for people to, to work with you in partnership rather than against you. Um, and if it takes a long time to get the plan adopted, there's several things you can do on the way to be very clear in case there was any avoidance of doubt. And what I would do is get, um, if I was advising any of you, is telling the story is really, really important. The public, um, the power of the public within this can be extremely powerful. So if you're very clear about what sort of homes you would like, where you would like them, the infrastructure you want, you know, there's a, f a few bits before you get to the full blown local plan that you can keep telling the community this, this is what they're getting. So that when something comes along which isn't, um, that's, you know, that can be quite powerful as part of that conversation, which is, well, that's, we didn't want that here. And it, it, was, it was not our decision. So I think it's about getting on the front foot. Um, and um, I will leave it at that. Thank you. Thanks. I'm going to risk one last question really quickly. Uh, I had Pete's hand up first. Martin, I'm sorry. I, Pete got there first. So Pete, Pete at the front, please. Gonna... Sorry, the mic's coming. OK. Um, right. We, we, I, I, it sometimes feels like people talking about two different worlds here um, because what we've heard about is interesting re relabouring. Fall out rate is what the rest of us call land banking. Um, and you also talked about build out rate. The problem, it's called the principal agent problem. If the person supposed to make the change doesn't benefit from it, it won't happen. Developers are commercial organisations. They've got a fiduciary duty. They need to maximise return to shareholders. That's not achieved by building more homes than they can sell and price, house prices coming down. And in fact, at a meeting organised by South East Strategic Le Leaders, a senior civil servant said they will release about 200,000 houses a year. Where does the remainder come from? Point made. I'm getting people shaking at me. Any quick, quick thoughts on that? Well, uh, my uh, thought on that is, therefore, 
uh, we need to diversify the market and local authorities need to get much more involved in the business of building homes that they would like to see in the areas that they would like to see them. Steve, any comments? Uh, absolutely. I mean, the, the points well made. Uh, the, the issues about uh, a combination of uh, incentives and, and, if you like, sanctions, and, and uh, the government has been uh, looking at that for some time, both the last government and this one. Uh, we talked about use it or lose it, um, and there's issues. I think it, uh, you t I think Desmond Tutu once said, "You catch more flies with honey." I think incentives are more likely to actually uh, uh, get developers to uh, build out quicker rather than sanctions. Marvellous. Thank you all very much. Um, just to remind you, there'll be a two-minute silence at 11 o'clock in the conservatory, um, which is coming up very soon. Thank you very much to, to our panel, to Victoria and Steve, and um, I'm sure there are around for further questions if you want them.